we're going to be talking about today, the Canadian Real Estate Association has come out with a whole bunch of new paperwork, a bunch of new guidance. We're going to be looking into what are they saying and how is it going to affect you? We got to somehow get through all the weeds to figure out how it's going to affect me and you. So Let's get right into the first article of the day, Canadian Real Estate Association. Now, we're going to be talking about the, the U.S., the Federal Reserve, a whole bunch of stuff today, but we're going to be kicking it off with the Canadian Real Estate Association comes out with this um, document every uh, single uh, month. So Ontario, the housing market snapshot for August 2022, it just has accumulated its numbers. Now, it says home sales are down 30 0.3%. What does that mean? Well, uh, it means that nothing is being sold, right? We can see that. Not a lot of people are buying right now. More importantly, 7.2% is the number of listings that have gone up. Well, we see all your neighbors, right? Everybody's putting their homes on the market. Um, but this is the interesting part. The average price of homes sold across Ontario has only gone down 0.6%. Okay, Canadian Real Estate Association, prices have only gone down 0.6%. This is where we got to do that little sniff test, you know, to see if this is actually correct. Because prices are have gone down a lot more than that. Now, I understand they're averaging out the prices across Canada, okay? Across, uh, I mean, across Ontario. So if they're doing that, they're going to be taking in some Thunder Bay, some Sault Ste. Marie, some small towns, right? But when you get to the bigger cities like Toronto, where we are, we can see areas that are down 25, 30% all over the place, right? So the larger the price points and the larger the leverage, the more that they have fallen. Okay, so let's continue on with what the Canadian Real Estate Association is saying. As we can see, the prices here, greater Toronto area was 1.2 million before. Now it's down to 1.1. So it's dropped quite a bit. Burlington is sitting somewhere similar, and so is London. Um, the Ottawa region actually has come down, and Niagara has gone up. Uh, so we're seeing some different prices uh, depending on where we are. What other information have they put out as the Canadian Real Estate Association? They're also saying that the number of home sales across Canada is down 24%. Okay, so that is letting us know a little bit about the market sentiment, right? Not everybody is out there trying to buy a home. Everybody is standing there like deers in headlights. 1.3 million people a day are looking on Realtor.ca. So everyone and their dog is looking for a home, but nobody's buying anything. That's what that number tells you. Number two, it's saying that the number of listings is up 3.3%. Well, that really depends on where you're looking, right? Because in a town like Toronto, we've seen in the hundreds of percent more listings on the market. Uh, last thing to look at is the average price of homes. It's only down 3.9% across the country. Listen, there is a lot more pain to come. But if you want to look at this a little bit more, let's uh, just take a look at this map. If we look at the map of Canada, the average price change across BC is up 1%. Alberta's up 1%. Uh, Manitoba's up uh, 3.7, Saskatchewan up 5. Ontario is the only one that's down 0.6% August to August, okay? August 2001 to August 2022. But listen to these numbers once we get into the Maritimes. 20% for New Brunswick, 17% for Nova Scotia, 17% for Prince Edward Island, 9% for Newfoundland. We're talking about massive price raises. They're, they're going bananas. They're going to the moon. Even as we're going through this massive correction, their prices are still killing it this year. All right. So that is very, very interesting. But why is it going up so high? Because their prices were very depressed. Everybody is moving out there to buy very low priced homes. That is why all of the Maritimes have been catching up. Prices have been going crazy over there. Okay. So that's what the, the uh, Canadian Real Estate Association is looking at. But Let's check out a couple other things. So I want you to go check out this website called iPolitics.ca. It's the article is called "You're Not Richer Than You Think." StatsCan is finding a steep decline in home ownership. If we go look at that article, I highlighted a couple of spots that uh, I just wanted to share with you guys. It says fewer people own homes than in previous years. Well, duh. 
Prices are crazy right now. Uh, millions of people are stuck in inadequate housing, and hundreds of thousands of them are too small for the number of people that live in them. The real numbers could be worse. Now, I got to tell you, the numbers are a lot worse. Canada, uh, regardless how, how you feel about it, left, right, you know, your blue, red, whatever, there is a lot of people that live in Canada that don't actually have their driver's license and so forth. They like overstay their visas or whatever. We're in the millions that come. Uh, and that can put a strain on houses. So many houses have multiple families living in it. Uh, a lot of cultures have three or four generations all living in one home. And that isn't across the whole spectrum. Housing prices have gone crazy because materials have gone up so much. Labor has gone up so much. We cannot afford to build it. So how do we solve this issue of this supply and demand imbalance when it comes to housing? There's two schools of thought here, okay? Supply and demand, that's economics 101, what you learn on the first day. So number one is we create a lot of supply, build a lot of houses. The second way is to destroy demand, make it so expensive that nobody in their right mind would buy it, okay? Those two ways. So the government cannot flip a switch and have homes printed by the millions, right? We don't have millions of workers just sitting around in case. But what they could do is raise the interest rates up so high that nobody would go buy anything. And that's what they're doing. Remember, my, I was just talking to you about my friend there going to buy a sink, $98 just a few years ago. And now it's $2.99 for the same sink. Crazy prices. Prices are gone up. Labor, in many cases, have doubled for the price of labor. A builder cannot build a home anymore for even close to a competitive price. So what are they going to do if they have no way of building more supply? They have to reduce demand. They have to. And so they are going to do that by raising those interest rates. But what is the real answer? If millions of people cannot afford a home, we got to make homes for them, right? You can't just make it so expensive that only a few wealthy people can afford them and everyone else is going to be homeless. That doesn't work either. So let's jump right back into uh, the article then. So it says real numbers could be worse. And it says rents are only going up. I'm sure that you guys all are seeing that the rents are just going up and up and up. Uh, more people are computing, uh, competing for fewer units. Okay, now that is one thing also I want to say. Inflation is just the number of dollars or currency units in, an, in any given country. The number of currency units divided by the number of goods. Goods or services, like the sales. So then that's inflation. Too much money going after too few goods. So here is the thing. If you have a home and a certain amount of money and they doubled the money supply, instantly the home could become double the price. But what happens when the money supply gets bigger? In addition, the homes get less. Now you're compounded. Now it's not just double. It could be triple, right? So we always have to be careful between the supply and demand uh, metrics back and forth. And that goes for money too. Money is a commodity that we always have to pay attention to as well. Now, it said in the article that landlords are passing these expenses on to their tenants. So a lot of people say that's not fair, but I also think it's not fair to the landlord. In many cases right now, taxes for the cities are going way up. Insurances are going way up. Property management is going way up. All the power bills that they pay are going way up and they're going backwards. They're going under. Now, a lot of people in Canada and the United States are saying, well, good, let the landlords pay for it. It's their problem, greedy landlords. It's not always some monstrous company that is out there that is just making money and they're, they can afford the loss. A lot of times it's this just a, a couple that have bought one unit just to rent it out, right? And they could be going under too. Also, here's something else to think about. Those giant companies that are big renters out there, that big company has shares. Guess who owns those shares most of the time? People like your mom and your dad, pension funds, even national funds. So when that company goes down, your pension may be suffering to pay you out later on. Everything is interconnected. So we got to really think about that stuff. All right, so let's go into the, the rest of the article, you guys. If we pull up the rest here, it says that people aged 25 to 29 had 44% ownership rate in 2011. 
Today, it's only 36%. So we can see a massive down, massive effect down on all of the uh, renters, right? And there, there's more renters and less home, less home ownership. It also said that 40% of new homes built between 2016 and 2021 are all rented out. So there is a big culture right now of people that are buying properties and renting them out. You and I can see that. It's in the news every single day. Now, this is a subject I wanted to get into. Do you notice this paragraph? This is, again, in ipolitics.ca. A lack of, this is with somebody's opinion. A lack of strong rent control in provinces like Ontario, where the Ford government ended it in units built after 2018, means that people will be rent evicted and forced further down the ladder, forcing many to leave the cities and further draining workforces. So for those of you who don't know what that means, if you have a property and you're renting, many states in the U.S., many places in Canada will say you can only raise the rent by 1%, 2% per year, whatever the rate is. It's usually de decided by some level of government. But in Ontario, any property before 2018 is rent controlled. Uh, uh, past 2018, it's not rent controlled. So this goes this big argument, right? Should we have rent control or should we not? Fortunately, we don't live in a world of just gray zone. There's been a lot of studies on this. And I want you to think about this from the other side, because almost all of the critics are very big renter pool critics. They, they want rent control for everybody. Never raise the rent on anybody. But just think about this. Rent, uh, the landlords want to buy properties to rent them out. So what do they normally look for? They look for places where they can evict somebody for non-payment. And they look for places that they can raise the rent. The illusion is, is that people like me and you or the landlord or the real estate agent is the one that dictates the price of the property. And that's not true. The price of the rent is voted on by the public. That's all it is. So I can have a one bedroom unit and put it up for $20,000 a month. And guess what? I'm never going to rent it out. I could put it up for $500 a month and it would go in like two seconds, right? It all depends on what the public feels that it's worth. So you should be able to put it wherever you want. Now, let me tell you, in the cities that have the uh, rent control that is not there, you can raise the rent as much as you want. You can evict for non-payment. A lot of landlords want to move to those areas and build units because their interest is protected. In that case, when you have trillions of more dollars coming in, they can now build a lot of units and have rental units. So usually those two things are working against each other. If you don't have rent control, you usually have a lot more rental units and vice versa. So it's kind of like competing interests. So anytime that you're going to have an argument, it doesn't really matter what it is or a discussion or a thought process, whatever it is, try to put yourself in both sides because then you can really see the whole picture, right? Um, all right, guys, let's jump uh, back into the rest of the story I wanted to tell you. Uh, the, the second to last one that I, I thought was interesting for me to bring up today, uh, of course, in the article daily hive, you can go look this up. Number of Canadian renters is growing more than twice as fast as homeowners. Of course, the prices have stretched everyone to the very brink. We cannot afford houses. It says here between 2011 and 2021, the number of renter household increased 54% in Kelowna. That is shocking. The number of renters went up 54% in 10 years. Barrie went up almost 50%, 41% in Oshawa, 40% in Kitchener, 40% in Nanaimo. This is crazy, right? That prices just keep on going up and up and up. And it's not going to stop. As the prices continue up, renting is going to be the only option for a lot of people. Now, if we move into a lot of this is coming from the Fed. Why do we always talk about the U.S. Fed, you guys. Here is the thing. After 1945 and the Second World War, we started this Bretton Woods Agreement. The Bretton Woods Agreement was that, okay, the United States is going to be the king of the world. They're going to, they only had the um, largest military ever that was left after the Second World War. They had all the money. They had the biggest GDP on the planet. Like It was a foregone conclusion. Of course, it was going to be them. 
but it was the end of the day of the Brits and, and then the Americans came on to play. Now, whatever happens to the United States normally trickles down to Canada, Australia. You know, it, it affects Europe. It comes right directly to Canada. So we have the benefit of seeing six weeks into the future what's going to happen in Canada by watching what the U.S. Fed is doing. So as we uh, look at what the U.S. Fed is doing, please note that as we uh, look through this stuff, the Fed is going to reset the U.S. housing market through a difficult correction. This is in the article in fortune.com. The Fed is going to reset the U.S. housing market through a difficult correction. Okay, so I got a lot of things I wanted to touch on today. So look at what he says. And I'm quoting, this is Jerome Powell. I'd say if you were a home buyer, somebody or a young person looking to buy a home, you need a little bit of a reset. We need to get back to a place where supply and demand are back together and where inflation is down again and mortgage rates are low again. That's okay. Sounds good, right? That we want a pricing reset. So he, uh, this is Jerome Powell, direct quote again, I'm quoting. So the declaration in housing prices is that we're seeing should help bring prices down more closely in line with rents and other housing market fundamentals. This is a good thing. This is a good thing, he said. For the longer term, what we need is supply and demand to be better aligned so that housing prices go up to a reasonable level and at a reasonable pace and that people can afford housing again. Again, it all sounds wonderful. Sounds like utopia. We probably, in the housing market, have to go through a correction to get that into place. Of course, a really bad correction. There are also longer run issues with the housing market. As you know, it is difficult to find lots around cities and so on and so forth. Listen, you guys, this is what really, really bothers me. Okay. Remember, everything comes back to supply and demand. In the United States, they are missing around 5 million homes. In Canada, we need about 1 million homes. We are worse per capita than the United States. We need a million, they need 6 million. We are not even close to even coming close to that. Remember, on the best of years, we're building 250,000 homes. And at the same time, the government now wants to bring in half a million people a year into the country as immigrants, and we have no places to put them. This is a problem. How do you get prices down? We need more supply. We need more houses. That's what we need. There is such a shortage that everybody is living like three, four generations, co-living with people, renting out rooms. There isn't enough homes. So to attack demand, I understand it's the easy, low-hanging fruit to do, but it's, it's still not helping anybody's quality of life. So the idea that if we're not building any homes, which we already covered, we're not building anything, uh, all these building projects are going on pause, on hold. They can't afford the labor. They can't uh, afford the materials. And everything is delayed six months, a year to get anything. So if we don't have enough houses now, where is everyone going to live after your plan? The price has got to come down. There are no new homes. Please remember that. So in order to make it affordable for somebody, you have to bankrupt somebody else in order to take the home from him and give it to somebody else. So the, the motion that we're going through right now is we are going to make it so expensive that we'll bankrupt millions of people so that we can make the homes more affordable to give away to other people. Am I the only one that doesn't see a problem with that plan? That is cuckoo, but that's what's happening, right? But it sounds wonderful. We're going to make prices so low that people can start to buy again. Well, you know, the poison pill here is that we got to bankrupt everyone else, which could bankrupt a lot of companies. This is a, a real tough thing, man. We've never been in this much debt nationally, corporately, uh, provincially, state-wise, anything. Highest debt ever and the highest rate hike ever. The amount of damage this is going to cause, it takes 12 months to 24 months for all of this to come through. There's going to be a lot of pain coming ahead, and it's going to hurt a lot of people, unfortunately. All right, let's uh, go on to a couple other things that Big Papa Powell is talking about, you guys. Um, more prices going down. Yeah, he said that there's going to be a big correction. He's saying he's going to break the fever. Okay, guys, these, this guy is a little crazy. Okay, um... Number five here, he says, but as long as inflation remains above the Fed's 2% target, Powell says the latter that uh, 
will be the central bank's main focus, even if it means pushing the economy into a recession to achieve it. This started last uh, November, I think, when they started announcing. You guys that follow me know I've been telling you to fix your rates from November, December, January, February. Fix, 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 fix. We fixed all of our rates. And this is going to continue, right? He is on a mission to hit 2% inflation. Listen, guys. Powell and company made themselves look like idiots last year. Inflation is taking off. And they said, no, it's not. Then finally, inflation kept was being there. And they said, oh, don't worry. It's transitory. <laughs> it's tra Remember that? Oh, yeah, yeah. It's going to come and go. Don't worry about it. And then when it's really biting everyone in the butt, then they're like, okay, okay, maybe we have to raise interest rates. So now that they have, remember, it's their credibility at stake. You know, it's kind of like a schoolyard bully, man. He, he, You can't diss him to his face, you know? So we have to make sure that we are going to be paying attention to this, okay? They're not going to let up. They got to get down to 2% inflation. Of course, you guys all know from the 80s, they've been manipulating that calculation to make it look a lot lower than it is. So even when they say that it's 8%, you and I know it's like double that. But they even want that new and corrected way of measuring it down to 2 They're going to keep on raising those interest rates. But they don't necessarily have to keep raising interest rates anymore, even though they will. Because the damage takes a full two years to take effect. So you saw them printing money for a long time and inflation wasn't biting. And then it hit. It takes a time between an earthquake and the tsunami hitting, right? So the, the rates is the earthquake, but that wave is traveling through and the damage will be coming. So there'll be more and more damage coming to the market over time. So you guys, this is going to be very, very scary, honestly, for all of you. If you are in a large home, I need you to continually process whether you should be in that home. If you know that interest rates will be continuing to go up and more and more and more people will be going down, more and more companies will have trouble, more and more companies will be closing, liquidating. It's a big problem. Now, everybody that you're going to go see, I want you not to believe one person. Don't just believe me. I want you to go do your due diligence, but everybody on Instagram and TikTok, YouTube, they're all saying now is the best time to buy, buy the dip. What a great deal, right? It's not a good deal if you're going to lose a lot of money. What I care about is your entire life's wealth preservation that you're going to hand down to your kids. I don't care about a commission one day. As you guys know, I, I deal with real estate in Toronto. So if you're in Toronto, I can help you out. Uh, if you're outside of Toronto, we, we help you out as advisors and consultants, but you can always reach me if you need me. But I want you to be okay in your wealth. Generational wealth is what I want you to do. Now, home prices if for the biggest homes are going to fall hardest. The bigger they are, the harder they fall. But if you're in entry-level homes, you're going to do really well. Everybody downgrades their homes through a slow time. Please do your research in every other recession that has ever happened. Pick your country. doesn't matter. Any country, any century, it's always the exact same. The second part that I really want you to pay attention to is food shortages. You guys, just yesterday, I did a video on it. They did a speech at the United Nations talking about the crisis that is coming in agriculture, that we will not be having enough food. Uh, also yesterday, let me share my screen with you. There was another thing that happened at the World Trade Organization. Please go look up NDTV. So that's November Delta, NDTV.com. India is defending its decision to ban rice and wheat exports at the World Trade Organization. So this is important for you guys to know because this is not just about wheat. This is not just about uh, rice. It's not just about that. If we go and look, that accusation, please don't ban the export of rice. What does that mean? That, that eludes some kind of imagination that they're sitting on billions of boats of it and just keeping it all for themselves. The reason that all these countries are banning the export of food is they have no food to feed their own citizens. They have nothing. India had massive problems. Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Indonesia, China. They don't have enough food to serve their own citizens. They don't have anything to ship out. And that is why the ban is there. Remember, the Northern Hemisphere feeds the Southern Hemisphere. We're going to find out in the next couple of weeks how much is, is coming. And if there was tons of corn out there, the prices wouldn't be going up. None of the prices would be going up. The fact that you're paying higher prices shows you that there are shortages. 
and those shortages are going to continue. So every time you go to the store, just try and buy one extra thing, one extra can, put it in the, in the cupboard, please. It, it's, it's not going to be too much. I don't want to inconvenience you. Just do that so that you have a little bit of a buffer, just a little bit. Buy the things you need. I'm not asking you to buy things that you don't normally use. Just get an extra tube of toothpaste and an extra um, can of soup or something. Because now that you're seeing these uh, trade problems between China does not want to ship anything to America or Canada for that matter. And Russia, they're, they're splitting apart the BRICS countries. Remember we said uh, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. They're trying to pull away and only do trade within their self. So if you find something in your house and you flip it over and it says made in China and you're like, wow, I use these all the time. Why not buy, just buy an extra one, Do you know, stock up on a couple of things. There's going to be a lot of rocky things that are going to happen, but here's the good part on the other side of this. Once we figure out all these supply routes and so on and so forth, we're going to be at a better place. Once we get to a better place, the things should be made closer to home. Hopefully everything will balance out, but it could be some rocky times until we get this supply chain figured out. But for sure, massive rocky times for properties and for food. So you guys, as you know, I'm always here for your health, wealth, and happiness. I want you to succeed. I want you to do well. I want you to crush it. Please, if this helps even you, one person that you know, send it to one person. We're trying to grow the channel, but you know, not a lot of people care about this type of stuff, about making sure that they're safe. Most people just want to go on online and watch the crocodile hunter or something. So, you know, do this, please. I want your family to be okay. Please remember to like, subscribe, follow, leave a comment if you like this type of stuff. And I'll see you on the next video. Thanks, everyone. Thanks so much for sticking around. If you like that video, you might like this one and maybe something like that.